who is just the coolest person on the planet, Janina. You um, I met Janina back in Edinburgh, although I maybe you didn't realise you were meeting me, Janina, but I was stalking you. And I came to see, I came to see you um, actually for your goddess book. Um, it was the children's book and it was the, and I thought, who on earth is this amazing, amazing person who's full of energy oh. and full of facts and was a feminist. And it, I was so kind of bowled over um, by you, but just in case, I'm sure everybody does know who you are. Um, but we've got with us today, uh, Dr. Janina Ramirez, who is the presenter of the BBC Raiders of the Lost Past, is a Sunday Times instant bestseller of Femina which uh, is, for me, one of those books that made me so mad when I read it, because it's about how women in history have literally been written out of history, and where, whose story is it? And um, it's not ours, us women out there. So I, with further ado, I, will, I want to hand over to the wonderful Dr. Janina and, and talk to us a little bit about um, Femina and um, your process of writing it. Thank you so much for joining us at our inaugural uh, Annex Story Fest. Thank you, Janina. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. Wow, what an exciting honour to be with you remotely. I am in Barcelona, of all places. Um, I've been, uh, Feminar has blown my mind. It's, it's, it's going around the world really fast and I'm chasing it. <laughs> so I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person, but I am so delighted and grateful to Susie and to Peter and to all the team for, for making this, this remote version of my talk possible. So if I begin talking to you, um, hopefully you can see my slides. Um, I want to start, it's a bit tricky because I can't see them myself, um, but I want to start, there we are, starting off, with the cover you may have seen it i'll just go back one slide and show you this is uh what is on the front of my book feminine and it is actually taken from an a painting an image a, a manuscript illumination done by this remarkable woman who you will hear about throughout the talk hildegard of bingham a 12th century polymath a the way i like to describe her is she is leonardo da vinci three centuries before Leonardo da Vinci and better than Leonardo da Vinci because she actually finished her project. Um, I think everybody should know her name. There's, I can't think of a living person today that did or can do what Hildegard did. She was a visionary, a theologian, um, a philosopher, but she was also the mother of uh, the natural sciences in Germany. She worked with medicine and cures. She worked on the flora and fauna and, and rocks of, of, her, of her surroundings. She wrote music, the most beautiful music. If you do one thing tonight after this talk, go home and look up Hildegard of Bingham music. It is so beautiful. I was asked today who would be a modern equivalent and I'd say Bjork because the way that Hildegard creates this perfect music for women's voices, but it's so searing, it's so ethereal and sort of almost fairy tale like because it jumps across the octaves. So she was a remarkable composer and she made she invented her own language. <laughs> and of course she was an artist. We're looking at this image here that she describes as the cosmic egg. But if you're seeing something else in the cover of my book, don't worry, you are correct because Hildegard is one of our most important sources for understanding how women of the medieval period interpreted their own sexuality, their own bodies, their position in the world alongside men. So I start my whole book with this quote, and I'm gonna start my talk with this quote by Hildegard. She says, I am the fiery life of divine substance. I blaze above the beauty of the fields. I shine in the waters, I burn in the sun, moon and stars what a, that quote inspired me through the whole of writing this book i cannot tell you how inspiring i found this woman and her words but first how did i come uh, to write this book well as susie very kindly said she came to see me talk at edinburgh about my other book that came out last year goddess 50 goddesses spirits saints and other female figures that who have shaped belief and um i was the first commission to write this book by the British Museum before the pandemic. Um, 
I thought, oh, that'll be easy. I'll just look up 50 stories on Wikipedia and turn them into my own prose. <laughs> How wrong I was. Um, first off, I'd set myself the very difficult challenge of, for the first time, between two covers, doing the mythology of every continent on the globe. And um, that meant that some of the stories I was having to access had not even been written down properly before. Some of them um, are orally transmitted mythologies and legends. I was having to go to such a diverse uh, array of source material in order to pull these stories together. And the other thing that made this such a challenging enterprise was that I'm very aware the majority of figures in this book are still actively believed in. These are active religions and the figures I'm writing about are important and precious to the people who venerate them. So I had to show the utmost respect. And that is hard when you're dealing with cultures that, you know, you might be encountering for the first time, like, um, you know, the Balinese um, traditions or or the Nat spirits and or the Aztec spirits. You know, how do you legitimately immerse yourself in that culture in order to draw out these figures and, and do justice to them. So what I thought was going to be a relatively easy project turned into the hardest project of my life. I ended up, um, when I was asked if I could provide a bibliography for this book, because it's written for younger readers, I didn't include a bibliography. Uh, so I put one together for some students and it came to over 2000 articles, texts, um, videos, recordings, archives that I consulted in the writing of this book, which is, I mean, thank, in a way, it was good. I had some time on my hands, <laughs> locked in various rooms being able to write. But in the process of writing this book, I changed my opinion on what I thought I was trying to do. When I was asked to write about goddesses, the first thing that came into my head were objects like these you can see these these used to be referred to as venus figurines so the venus of Vinendorf, the venus of holofowls um that term of course you uh, scholars have argued we shouldn't be using that term anymore it's a roman term it's it, it post dates these objects by thousands and thousands of years so now we refer to them as the female figurine of Vinendorf and of holofowls and um these images have have, have long interested me because on the surface, what they seem to show is ancient veneration of women going back more than 10,000 years and veneration of the female body, particularly, I think, in these cases, in the act of procreation, their, their role is, as fertility goddesses. So you, you can tell a little bit more about this because, you know, with the Willendorf example, she has these great pendulous breasts and huge hips, but particularly with the other one, the whole of bells, I've, I've spent time with this little object. It's so beautiful and it inspires me so much. It's tiny, it's about this big. Um, again, you have the pendulous breasts, but what's different with this one is it's such a worn body. You can see stretch marks all the way across the torso. This is a, a body that has lived and I think birthed, but also uh, there's another complexion to this. So at face value, they look like they're all about fertility. When you look at the Hall of Fells one, she doesn't have a head. Can you see? Instead, in the place of where a head should be, there's a hook. And that hook would have meant that this figurine could be worn around the neck like this. Then what happens is that the head of the goddess is actually the head of the wearer. So you're imbuing the power of the goddess into yourself by wearing it. So already out of the traps, I was starting to think, I think there's more to goddesses than simply their, their aspect of fertility and childbirth. And I went straight back into deep history in order to try and understand this further. Um, my heart is going out to Turkey right now. If any of you want to donate, I have links on all my social media pages. I, I feel for them so much. I spent a lot of time in Turkey working on a film about the world's oldest city, Çatalhöyük. That's an image of it there. It's a fascinating place. And, um, and out of this, the, the, this incredible, I mean, it is like a city. It's sort of like high rises all next to each other. And the way that people moved through the city was that they would walk across the rooftops of the houses and then drop down ladders into their own homes. And they kept this place pristine. They had sort of 
communal dump areas and they whitewashed their homes every year. And one of the extraordinary things is that they buried their dead beneath the floors of their houses. So Chatelhoyak has left this unique archaeological record in terms of bones and DNA. Um, in amongst these buildings, there were numerous female figurines coming up, but this one is probably the most famous. Uh, she's about yay big and she's made of clay. And you can see she has this, this big, big face, very elaborate hairstyle. And again, you know, you have the pendulum, pendulous breast, the pendulous belly. If you turn her around, she has the most extraordinary bottom that hangs over the back of her throne. But what I find interesting here is, is the throne is made up of two panthers. She has subdued these two cats, these two big cats under her power, under her authority. And the reason I want to think a little bit more about Chatelhuyak is the skeletons that were found here. I mean, I have to, uh, to sort of put this in context. Chatelhuyak is about 6000 BC and older. And so we are going right back into, into sort of um, prehistory, if we like. What was revealed here is something quite extraordinary. If you are to if you were to survey cemeteries around the world, particularly you know, in the last few hundred years, you would see in almost every cemetery circumstances distinct differences between male and female skeletons. These are differences in things like the sorts of labours that these individuals undertake. You'll see women often with repetitive if, in, um, uh, markers on their bones from doing um, housework, from, from doing kind of these the manual labour of the home. Whereas men, the traditional example is that you know if you think about the long bowmen that fought at Cressy, the English longbowmen in the 14th century, they were repeatedly pulling back their bow. And this led to a very overdeveloped shoulder muscle. And you see that sort of shoulder muscle um, developed in, in male uh, skeletons. You also see that they suffer from different health issues. And particularly, you, you usually see that male skeletons are much better developed, much better fed, much stronger, while women's are not. But at Chattelhoyak, that is not the case. All, the female and the male skeletons are performing the same acts. They are eating the same food. They are of similar stature. They are living to the same sort of age. They are stuff. You know, this is, if ever we could find an archaeological record for some sort of gender equality, we have to go back over 8,000 years to Chatelhoyak to find it. So that started to, to play on my mind about the idea of the role of women in various societies. And moving forward another few thousand years to Minoan Crete, when I was making this series of Raiders of the Lost Past, I was really trying to ask the question over and over again, where are the women? Where is everybody else? I don't want to just know about the kings and the emperors and the, the rich people. I want to know how this society is functioning. And it, what is fascinating in Minoan Crete is that it seems to be the women in the palace at Knossos that are recorded as doing all of the major political and religious and social activities. The men, the, this is a non-warrior society, Minoan Crete, because they are not engaged in internal conflict and they are an island that at this point is not being repeatedly assaulted from outside. The men are there to, to sort of protect, but they're also there in their athletic roles. You see images of them bull leaping. In all of the images of ceremonies, like this one here, this wall painting, it's always the women that are performing the major acts. And it seems that the, the what we call the throne room at the Palace of Knossos was designed for women. There's this wonderful exhibition on at the Ashmolean in Oxford at the moment, and they've got one of the wall paintings from Knossos on display. And it's amazing. It shows the Great Court, which is a huge space. And every spectator in the Great Court, in, including all the ones that are enthroned, all the ones that are in power, every single one is a woman. Are we actually looking at a matriarchy here with Knossos? So I was asking all these questions. I was reading all these myths, all these stories about powerful females in belief. And I was looking at examples of powerful women in history. And it was starting to make me challenge my own expectations of what I wanted to achieve in this project. Because what I found was that these goddesses don't just show us about fertility, about childbearing, about being domestic goddesses and being beautiful. What they actually show us is all of the richness and complexity of human life. Women represent everything, 
in the same way that men do. They can represent war, they can represent death, they can represent jealousy, anger, um, they can represent physical strength, um, but they can also be dark. They can represent um, you know, demons and they can shape shift and turn into other animals. So I went into writing Femina very aware that when I'm searching for women in the past, what I'm actually trying to do is shine a light on the complexity of humanity, both men and women across time. So with that in mind, <laughs> I lead you towards Femina. I realize there is a typo in here. I've got the numbers wrong on my chapters. Um, forgive me, I've been racing around all over Europe and, and I'm a bit, bit tired. But um, in these, well, I wanted to do something very different with Femina. Now, I'm a medievalist. I've been studying uh, the medieval period for decades now. And I know that there are these remarkable women. I have read the works of Marjorie Kemp and Julian of Norwich. I've known about the work, the, the works of Anne Caresses and the importance of people like St. Hilda. But I don't think other people outside of medieval studies necessarily do know those things. I, um, I struggle with trying to really sell the medieval period to people. The classical period is very sexy. There's lots of lovely re remains from uh, Egypt and Greece and Rome. The Renaissance, the, the Enlightenment, those periods, surely they're the foundations of our modern identities, our modern worlds. Why should we bother with this middle period, this dark age when all the lights go out and it's all about ignorance and superstition? Well, that's the problem. The medieval period has been branded for us deliberately branded for us. It was a very successful PR campaign by the reformers from Martin Luther onwards. Because the Reformation was and the Enlightenment were about rejecting the papacy, rejecting the Roman Catholic Church and its legacy across those thousand years in, in Europe, the effective way to show that this new age was was the one worth pursuing that the new age was going to take us into the future you have, all of the texts referring to the previous um, epoch the medieval period cast it in this light but once you actually start scrutinizing the evidence once you actually go back and look at this time that couldn't be more wrong i have done so many programs that i've tried to share with with viewers with all of you showing how bright, how beautiful, how rich, and, and actually how ideologically expansive the medieval period is. And we're talking a huge amount of time. My book starts in the seventh century and it finishes going right up into the 15th. That is more time than the distance between us and the, the 15th century. So there's so much variety, so much change across that time. And in that, that period. It is extraordinary women for me that highlight the richness of the time. So we might think that um, our hard won rights that we enjoy today are the results of the suffragettes. A hundred years of suffrage, if the suffragettes hadn't have made the efforts that they had in the end of the 19th and early 20th century, we wouldn't have the, the liberties that we have today. But at the start of this book, I had a complete eureka moment. I was reading about one of the most famous suffragettes, Emily Wilding Davidson. You may have heard of her. She was the suffragette who ran out into the concourse during the 1913 Derby. And she tried to tie a suffragette's banner onto the king's racing horse. In the process, she got knocked down and she died. And she became a martyr to the suffragette movement. In fact, her funeral to date is the single most attended non-royal funeral in English history. She was so celebrated and numerous books and documentaries and um, articles have been written about Emily. In those books, she's shown as this sort of militant uh, woman who was prepared to die for her beliefs. But I found this footnote and then a footnote on a footnote that said something that caught my attention. Emily Wilding Davidson was a medievalist. I'm a medievalist. I thought, oh, what? I looked a bit further. Emily had actually attended Oxford, my university. Um, she had completed the equivalent of a degree in medieval literature, but because she was a woman, she couldn't graduate at this point. 
Having completed her studies, she carried on writing about medieval topics. She wrote over 200 articles about medieval poetry, about, um, she wrote creative literature where she sort of imagined a medieval world of which she was a part. And she called herself Fair Emily after Chaucer's character. She was immersed in the medieval period and loved it. And the more I looked, the more I realized she wasn't alone. Many of the suffragettes had a fascination with the medieval period. And one of the main banners, the main sort of um, images that we associate with them is Joan of Arc. Deeds, not words. You know, this idea of Joan of Arc being this warrior woman who could defy gender and, and, and you know, reach the heights of military success. So I thought, well, why is she so fascinated by the medieval past? And as I started to read Emily's works, I realized what she was arguing. She and the other suffragettes were not existing in a vacuum. They were not inventing the idea of women's rights. They were not saying, I know what's a great idea that's never been done before. Let's give women some equality. Let's raise them up and give them the vote and give them some of the rights of men. She was saying, 500 years before me, there were these medieval women who had agency, who had power, and we want to go back to that. Why have we, as um, you know, a, a, women, been denied access to these rights for the last few hundred years? We want them back. Now, I don't know about you, but that gave me the shivers because I suddenly thought, yeah, we have had our history written for us over the last four, um, few hundred years. And I refer back to that thing I mentioned about the Reformation. The Reformation was critical for determining where we find ourselves now. With the, uh, it's Martin Luther who coins the phrase, a woman's place is in the home. And quite an important thing happened with, uh, with that moment where the monasteries were closed. From the very beginning of my book with the Loftus Princess at the start of this book, I talk about the, the huge role that women have played within the Catholic Church. Now that might sound idiosyncratic today, we would think of the Catholic Church as possibly one of the most hostile environments for women, one of the most patriarchal systems. But right from its inception, women played a huge role in the, in the spreading and supporting of the Catholic Church. And the thing that they really lent into, the thing that they really benefited from was the, the foundation of convents and double monasteries. Now imagine yourself back over a thousand years. You have at this point two options in life. On the one hand, you can stay within the secular world. You can be married. Um, your marriage would be determined by your father or your brother or whoever the nearest uh, authoritarian man was. They, they could determine your marriage. And you would be then expected to go through pregnancy and childbirth, which was an often deadly experience. That life would then lead you to, to be within the domestic sphere and supporting the men around you. But the second option that medieval women have, and this is one that we really don't give them enough credit for, is they could cho choose not to have that life. They could choose to enter a religious environment. And a lot of this comes down to our understanding of the word convent, nun. Today we think of quiet, pious places where these sacrificial women have taken themselves away from the pleasures of the world. That is not what a medieval monastery was like at all. They were often palatial, rich and beautiful places full of rich, beautiful women. And in these spaces, women were safe for a start, but they were also able to learn. These were the universities, the hospitals, the, the music centers, the art centers of the medieval world. They could, they could create, they could really explore the reaches of their intellect. But with the Reformation, they closed the monastic houses. Male monastics, monks, were given the option to carry on within universities, they were able to carry on within the church, but women were closed down that option. And they were told from that point onwards, sorry, your only role is as wives, mothers, and inside the home. So I think we have to look at this as a sort of long development. And that's why I think this book is, yeah, I hope, important. But I've had this slide up in front of you with its typo for some time. Why is it up? Well, I've read a lot about medieval women over a long period of time. And there are some spectacular 
spectacular books that have been published, particularly since the 1960s. I'm thinking in particular of Henrietta's Leisner's A Social History of Medieval Women. It is encyclopedic, it is brilliant. But um, something that all these books do, did, and I don't think it was even conscious, I think it, it's sort of an echo of our latent uh, inheritance as, in our roles as women, was that the, the chapter headings were always off much of a muchness. It would start off with something like mothers, wives, you might have um, aunts, sisters, but then you might have a little section on queens, and then possibly a little section on nuns, and then others. <laughs> those, those few that seem to not fit those categories. Well, I wanted to go in with something very different for this book. I wanted to make sure that every subtitle to each chapter hits a characteristic or a, uh, a word that I think most people would automatically associate first with men. So my first chapter is movers and shakers. My second one is decision makers, warriors and leaders, artists and patrons, polymaths and scientists, spies and outlaws, kings, yes, kings, not queens, and diplomats entrepreneurs and influencers, exceptional and outcast. So from the very off, I'm, I'm sort of trying to liberate uh, these medieval women from our modern ideas of their roles and show a more rounded facet to their significance. But the other thing I thought was so important with this book is it's not just about individual women. We have had so many books over the last 10, 15 years. I, I've written the goddess one myself, but it's sort of 50 brilliant women from history you should know. And you get a couple of pages on this woman and they sort of exist in a vacuum as a genius and that's it. That is not what this book is at all. Yes, I introduce you to brilliant women in each chapter, but it's about the context that those women are emerging from. These women do not exist in a vacuum. They exist in a complex, diverse, fascinating medieval world with men and women in it. Our problem has been that our history has been written about the few, and those few are usually, sorry to offend anybody, but they're usually great white rich men, and everybody else is sort of kept below that status quo. And as we move into the industrial age, as we move into the age of colonialism and imperialism, that structure was sort of transplanted across the world as a model of civilization. Um, the few are in control and should be honored, and then the many are not part of the narrative. Well, I think things are changing, and I think we want to see ourselves in the past. And this book is trying to do that, but looking back to the medieval period. Okay, let me take you on a journey. We're going up the North Yorkshire coast, or down I think, <laughs> the North Yorkshire coast, to, uh, uh, to a little place called Street House. It's about 15 kilometres from Whitby. Now if you're a medievalist like me, the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word Whitby is Hilda, St Hilda, that extraordinary woman who supervised at the Synod of Whitby had extraordinary influence as the abbess of a double monastery, men and women, on that high cliff, that iconic high cliff at Whitby. And this is a lesser known area, street house, but what a fascinating site. It's perched uh, or again on a, on a sort of liminal space you could think of really. You've got the sea so close and the North Sea and the world beyond that North Sea um, really present. But it's in, of interest to me because it's been um, excavated over a number of decades. The main excavator is the wonderful archaeologist um, named Stephen Sherlock. I love his name because I think of him as like a detective of archaeology, Sherlock Holmes of archaeology. Um, and him and his team have been excavating this site for a long time. Lots and lots of things have come up from this, this area, including one of the oldest um, surviving uh, Neolithic houses. Um, there are Roman remains on this site. Uh, there are lots of Iron Age and uh, Bronze Age uh, buildings, the remains of those on this site as well. And, um, and there's even this object, this, this structure that we don't really know what it was for. It seems to be some sort of circular, uh, sort of mini circular Stonehenge. And it's left this evidence in the ground. And what I love is that when the team found it, they would say, well, it, it could be ceremonial, it could be religious, it could be practical. We don't really know what it is. So we're going to call it a wasset, as in, what is it? 
<laughs> so there's the street house was it was found on this site it's a it's it's a site that has got a memory an echo that pulls back through the not just the centuries the millennia but this particular set of finds i i was fascinated by they were digging through um this area where you can see earlier uh, roundhouses and um hoping to find earlier material but it became clear quite quickly that there was a cemetery arrangement here can you see that it's um there's there's a rows of graves that that are arranged almost in a square with an open section at the front and as the team were digging they started to realize that no these weren't really really old uh, they weren't bronze age or iron age they were well, um, anglo-saxon they were early medieval dating to around the turn of the seventh century and it looks already just from looking at the plan you can see there is a order there is a structure to the way that these graves are arranged they run up either side across the top and there seems to be a focus of interest around this raised mound and there's also evidence for a couple of little wooden structures now following the arrangement of the graves and that opening area it seems like this is some sort of an enclosure that people could process or move through and you would move through that main open area at the bottom up past the primary mound and round and out so what is going on with this primary mound if there is a primary mound it, it will be the focus of this cemetery the most venerated the most um, important person possibly within that community and this is a reconstruction of who we think it was underneath that mound now she is become known as the Loftus Princess. The skeletal material itself was lost, so uh, she doesn't, she didn't come out of the ground like this. In fact, there was very little remaining, but what did come out was this set of jewels that you can see hanging around her neck. And they are utterly unique. I've done a lot of work on early medieval jewelry and seeing this pendant, this Loftus pendant, it just captured my imagination. I I've learned to sort of read and interpret the symbols of, of that period and what something like a serpent might signify or something like an eagle might signify in early medieval jewelry. Well, I'll show you a bit more about this and hopefully you'll be able to follow my train of thought of why I got so excited. These are the pendants that were strung around the Loftus princess's neck. You can see here two cabochon garnets. They're the big rounded ones. And these are very much of this fashion in Byzantium at this point. So the Emperor Theodora, she is shown in Ravenna with this with similar necklaces. But the middle pendant, this is the big one there. This is where I get really excited because here you have distinctive Germanic Anglo-Saxon jewellery techniques at work. If any of you uh, managed to catch my programmes on Treasures of the Anglo-Saxons or um, Sutton Who, You'll have heard me wax lyrical about this technique of golden garnet cloisonne. It's a very complicated technique, very hard to reproduce. Uh, indeed, when I was working on the Sutton Hoof shoulder clasps, I went to Garrard's jewellers, the royal jewellers, and I asked them how much money it would cost to, to recreate the shoulder clasps, how long it would take, and how they'd go about doing it. They said with £100,000, they could get the materials together. With three months of work, they could have a go at making them, but they would have to use lasers. The technology involved in making these little garnets that sit with no adhesive, no glue inside these gold casings, each with its own gold backplate with a stamped checkerboard on it that refracts the light. This is, I mean, the idea that these things are being made with no running water, with no electricity, probably in the open air, susceptible to the elements, it beggars belief these things got made at all. So I get very excited when I start to see them. Indeed, I've got some images here to help you um, uh, understand how how kind of om omnipresent these these golden garnet cosmo jewels were. These are examples from the Staffordshire hoard. And you can see uh, that example there in the middle, really, really small. It's, it's a hilt for a sword. And um, on the outside, it's got a similar pattern, that sort of um, 
the, the shapes that are connecting uh, in quite geometrically along the border. And in the middle, these interconnected um, quadrupeds, these creatures, this is zoomorphic interlace, that's um, yeah, animal interlace. And they are knotting over each other in these complex technical patterns. The image on the right there, is from the Frank's casket, which if you haven't seen it, if you can get to the British Museum to see it, it's an enigma. It's such a weird object. It's about the size of a shoebox. It's made of whalebone. And on each panel, there's a different enigmatic scene. You've got scenes from all parts of history. You've got Jewish history, the, the sacking of the temple in Jerusalem. You've got Roman history, Romulus and Remus being suckled by the wolf. You've got Germanic mythology and Christian imagery. You've got the nativity on the front of this box. It is, it has actually driven people mad studying the Frank's casket because it is so complex and there's still so much to be decoded about it. But I'm zooming in on this one image. And what does this image show us? Well, if you look with me, you'll see uh, on the far right of the image, there's a woman in a gown and she is strangling birds. The birds are sort of up the side. Then there's another woman walking to uh, moving towards the left who's carrying uh, a bag and a third woman who's reaching out to take something from the man that is positioned on the far left now this man has a beard a moustache he's wearing the traditional sort of anglo-saxon um tunic and you can see that his one of his legs is bent backwards in his hands he has what looks like a goblet and in the other hand what looks like an anvil and just tucked underneath his legs is a body with no head. What is going on here? Well, this scene is a reference to the Germanic pagan mythological story of Welland the Smith. Um, you may, well, I'm sure every one of you in that room uh, knows that after the Romans left Britain, in around 410 AD, there was this power vacuum and into it slid this warrior elite that were coming over from the Germanic territories, the Angles, Saxons and Jutes, which is so roughly Northern Germany, Denmark area today. And they brought with them their language, they brought with them their military society, their art, as you can see with this jewelry, and they also brought their language. The fact we speak English today and not some, sort of, some form of Celtic Welsh or, or Gaelic, is because of these incoming Germanic settlers. And they settled and they changed the complexion of England forever. But this religion that they brought with them, their belief system was a pantheonic one. There were many uh, gods and goddesses. You might know some of them from the days of the week. Tiu, the god of war, that's who gave us Tuesday. Woden gave us Wednesday. Woden is the chief of the gods. Uh, he gave up one eye for wisdom. Thor gave us Thor Thursday, Thursday, that's the god of thunder. And Frey, Freya, gave us Friday, god of fertility. So we're still living with the legacy of these gods and goddesses today. Welland is a mythological figure within this, this um, pantheon of, of gods and goddesses. His story is rather sad. He um, was the finest smith of his time, and he was like a magician. Indeed, there is an alchemy with making jewellery, because you're taking a raw stone, a raw material, a raw substance, heating it to extreme, you know, up in the thousands heat, where it turns into a liquid. You're then melding it through the use of a cast into something else where it becomes solid again. And then that entity, that gold, becomes resistant to time. You know, the Sutton Hoo treasures, the, the Staffordshire Hill treasures, they've lain in the ground for over a thousand years and they come out looking like they were made yesterday. So there is an alchemy and magic to it. Now, Welland caught the eye of the King Nidand. Nidand knew that this, uh, this, this uh, craftsperson was going to go away, was going to you know, serve all the, the royals, all the warriors uh, of the kingdom, but he wanted to keep him all to himself. So he took Welland and hamstrung him, that is cutting the tendon behind the back of the knee so that effectively he could not escape, he could not run, and then imprisoned him on an island. Welland was not going to take this lying down. He hatched a plan of revenge. First of all, he lured the king's son over with promises of jewellery and wealth. He killed the son and cut the son's head off. So the figure you can see lying there, that is the king's son. It gets a bit gory now. He fashioned a goblet out of the son's skull. And then he lures over the king's daughter. 
he uses the sort of medieval equivalent of rohypnol, a sort of date rape drug, drug if you like, and he puts this drug into the cup, offers it to the daughter. He then impregnates her. And then he escapes on a flying machine made from the feathers of birds that you can see being plucked on the edge of that scene. This is gritty. This is um, earthy <laughs> stuff. But um, the reason I think it's significant is because it highlights to us how uh, revered Smiths were in the early medieval world and how revered the things they produced were. So when we see something like this, when we see something like the Sutton Hugh shoulder class, yes, it is stunning, it is beautiful, but it's more than that, it's symbolic. It's, it's symbolic of having um, the capacity to commission one of these magicians, one of these skilled Smiths to make something precious for you. And that's why uh, when I was looking at the Loftus Princess's pendant, I started to think about her position in society. She was clearly rich and influential and um, had a position to play for it within her community. She was venerated in her community. Now, Loftus is a strange place, as I mentioned, and um, it seems that the echoes of that landscape were never truly forgotten. Another woman was buried quite near to the Loftus Princess, and she was also buried with some ceremony. And she was wearing a necklace. Now, I think you'll like this. This necklace is constructed using beads that have been, uh, some of these are reused from uh, Roman beads. And again, this, we're talking a seventh century burial. The two coins you can see are, um, are Celtic coins. They, are, they predate this burial by hundreds of years. That means that whoever the owner of this necklace was, has been an archaeologist themselves. They found these coins, these already ancient coins, somewhere around Street House. Thought they were beautiful, thought they were symbolic, and had them turned into a necklace. I find that amazing. It kind of makes me think, you know, human curiosity has always been there. We're not that different, even though we're separated by, by centuries. Um, so she's taken these two coins and turned them into a necklace that's quite dramatic because on the front face of both the coins are horses. I don't know if you can see them. The horse on the right, is the, the snout of the horse is sort of pointing upwards. It's a stylized horse. And on the one on the other side, you can see it's, it's sort of elongated. The effect of having them hung in this way is that the horses almost have a cinematic effect. It's like the horses are running across. They're in motion. So this is a beautifully designed piece of jewellery. I'd love to wear something like it myself today. But what's interesting is what's on the other side of these coins. religious symbols, um, a cross on, in both cases, two crosses. And this is where I'm coming to the sort of heart of why I started my book with this individual, why I think she's significant as um, an opener into the story of, of women's potential, women's agency across the medieval period. Is this five, these fives, the Loftus Princess's pendant, date from a moment of great change. Now, we have moments like 1066, which I also write about in the book. I, I write that the Bayeux tapestry should be called a mistress piece and not a masterpiece. And it was made by women, so therefore we should think about the women that made it. Um, but there are moments like 1066 where Britain, you know, England is invaded and cataclysmic change takes place and there is a change in the order of things. You know, France becomes super important in relation to England. But there are other changes that take place. And one of the most significant, I think, takes place uh, traditionally, we're told the year is 597 AD. And this is not a uh, conquest of, of, of warfare. It's not violent as such, but it is an ideological revolution, an ideological transformation. And many books have been written about it. This time it's called The Coming of Christianity. 597, St. Augustine arrives on a ship from Rome, sent by the Pope to convert the pagan um, English to to Christianity. I just love this term, the coming of Christianity. I say in, in the book in Femina, so rarely are there points in history where everything before stops and a new era starts, suggesting that in 597 with the arrival of August, Augustine, <laughs> I, I sort of get this picture in my mind that everyone went to bed the morning before thinking about Thor and Odin and Freya and all those gods and goddesses and woke up the next day and went oh christianity has come it was about jesus all along and everybody suddenly converts and everything becomes new and um, it's not like that at all there is so much regional variety it takes a long time christianity took 
centuries to really embed itself back into into England. But this moment of transition is important because what you see is it's almost like uh, the Silicon Valley explosion. You know, there's the pioneers, there's the entrepreneurs who get on board and think, oh, this new way of life looks interesting. Oh, is that how they're doing it over in Europe? What what can it give to us? What benefits? does Christianity give to us? And you get these early people who are sort of getting involved in the startups, if you like, and they leave behind these objects. This is a fascinating little object. It's called the Eccles Buckle. And um, the reason I think these objects are significant is even today, the way we dress, the way we wear our hair, the jewelry we wear, the, the clothes we wear, they are expressions to others of what we project what we want to project, sometimes what we don't want to project, but how other people react to us is in response to those signifiers. So the person wearing this belt buckle, to anybody that's looking, is wearing a buckle that has very traditional pre-Christian Germanic imagery on it. There's a double-headed serpent like Jormungand the world serpents. There are more knotted serpents running down the sides. It's, it's blingy, it's obviously a piece of sort of um, warrior attire, and it's, it's keeping with the status quo at the time that this is being made at the end of the sixth century. But on the inside, there's something secret. There is a fish applied, stuck onto the back of this brooch. Why a fish? Well, you'll know that they're still uh, Christianity is still signified by the symbol of the fish because its uh, its name in Greek is ichthyus, and if you take each of the letters of the Greek wo um, word ichthyus, you can create the phrase Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. So it becomes a symbol as um, a sort of clue to those in the know that the person using that symbol is Christian or, or you know is reaching out and using Christian ciphers. So the fact this individual has sort of tucked the fish on the inside, it's a way of hedging your bets. It's a way of saying, you know what, I'll keep one foot in with the old gods and I'll try out the new ones too, just in case. Um, and then we see other objects. This is the beautiful Kingston brooch. These sorts of brooches start to appear and they're, instead of being arranged on a three, in, in uh, the, the sacred number for Woden was three. You often see three triskels or three raven's heads to signify Odin. This is arranged on a four. And I think what we're getting here is the emergence of the cross coming through in, in this um, me medieval art. I've got a race because I, I know I haven't got much time. I always talk too much. But bringing it back to women, the idea that Christianity arrived with St. Augustine in Kent in 597 is something I want to fundamentally challenge. And I want to propose that the real founder of Christianity in England is not St. Augustine, but Bertha of Kent. Now, who is Bertha of Kent? She was a Frankish princess and she married Ethelbert, the king of that kingdom, of the kingdom of Kent, probably around 560, 570 AD. As part of her marriage agreement, she insisted that she was allowed to practice her Christian religion in the pagan kingdom of Kent. She requested a church and it still survives today. This is one of the oldest um, churches to survive in the English speaking world. It's St. Martin's in Canterbury. And you can even see the fact that there's some of the stones that have been reused from the earlier Roman building that was on that site. She worshiped here and she brought other women in her entourage who were also Christian. And she brought with her a bishop a bishop of her own to convert and preach to the people of Kent. And I love it when things like this happen. It is so hard to access the early medieval period. And occasionally you'll just get all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle adding up and piecing together. And at St. Martin's in Canterbury, this, this place we know that Hilda, uh, that Bertha was practicing Christianity at, this hoard was discovered, known as the St. Martin's Hoard. And in amongst them was this medalette. This is known as the Ludhard medalette. And it dates again to the end of the sixth century. What have we got here? We've got an image of Bishop Ludhard. That is the bishop that came with Bertha in the 570s, 580s. What you can see around the edge is it says Episcopus Ludhardus. This is the Bishop Ludhard. And you can see that the individual has been shown like a, a traditional sort of Roman coin. But what's fascinating is that the writing is backwards. Now, lots of scholars that have worked on this material have said, oh, it's because the Anglo-Saxons were so ignorant, they didn't read, they were illiterate, they didn't know what they were doing, and so they put it back to front. Now, 
That's not entirely wrong. Yes, they did not know what they were doing because yes, Anglo-Saxon England was a place without um, literacy in the sense of writing down law codes or documents, things like that. Um, and they certainly didn't know Latin at this point, which of course was the tool of the church. But what they have done is they have taken the coin, which is presumably based on a Frankish model. They have copied it, made a cast of it, stamped it, and then as it's come back, the language has been reversed. And because they, they don't understand the Latin, they don't know it, it's back to front. So me, for me, this is an object of extreme transition. This is showing a world where there's curiosity, interest in this Christian Europe, but it's still so poorly understood. All aspects of it are poorly understood. This is Empress Theodora that I was mentioning, and she is thousands of miles away in Constantinople, but all the way up in Street House in, um, in Loftus, we have a necklace that is modelled on this necklace that the Empress is wearing. So we're starting to see that they are reaching out, touching this Christian world. This is another necklace, known as the Desborough necklace, that was found in Kent. And can you see the similarities? Can you see the cabuchon garnets? And what's on this that isn't on the other one? A cross in the middle. Christian, it's a Christian object. And we start to see slowly going through the sort of 690s, 600, uh, sorry, 590s, 600s, 610s, objects like these that are, they have one foot in the pagan Germanic past in terms of the golden garlic cosme and one foot touching into the Christian future. Now, I'm going to speed up because I want to finish up with the Loftus Princess. Um, I think what was going on with the Loftus Princess's pendant, do I have an image of it? Uh, if I take you, I'm going to have to go back, sorry for this. But if I remind you again what it looks like, it looks like this. And in the middle, there is a shell. Now, I don't know if any of you in the audience have ever done the, um, uh, the Camino, the, Santiago, the, the route to Santiago de Compostela, the pilgrim route to St. James. Well, all, all the way along that route are shells. That is the symbol of martyrdom, the symbol of pilgrimage. Here in the middle of this pendant is an enormous garnet shell. Now, the Loftus Princess is not walking around wearing a cross. She's not even wearing a fish. She is wearing a symbol that is distinctly Christian, but more esoteric, more sort of, I don't know, for those in the know, you have to be able to decode it. So what we could speculate, and this is all we can do when we have fragmentary evidence, is that this individual is being buried in ceremony. She has come out of an elite Anglo-Saxon environment, and she is in this location near to St. Hilda's um, Monastery of Whitby, near to Hartlepool, near to all these emerging powerhouses of northern women who are setting up convents for themselves. So we could say that possibly she was one of these powerful abbesses. What we definitely know is that at the turn of the seventh century, this woman was signing up for the new fashion. She could see that being a part of this new religious framework would empower her, would give her opportunities. And just that little pendant around her neck is the clue we need to reassess the role that women played in spreading Christianity from the very earliest years. Now, that is just the first chapter of the book. I have not told you about the Cathar um, spies. I have not told you about Hildegard of Bingham, who I did at the beginning. I want to have more to say about her. Jadwiga, the king of Poland, the Burka warrior woman, these individuals who are breaking down our assumptions of the past. But I just wanted to tell you this story of this one woman who was lost, had vanished. If it hadn't have been for Steve Sherlock's trowel and his team, their, their trowels pulling these remains of her out of the ground, we would have lost a little bit of this story. And I think it's an important story that we need to keep telling. Thank you. That's the end of the presentation. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm a, I think I'm a medi medievalist. I think I'm with you, and I love that it's a North, strong, powerful Northern woman. That's fantastic. Yeah. I think we have got a couple of um, questions. Can we, can we, from the audience? If there's any questions over there, I'll take some here. But I had, I'd prepared from some um, earlier that we had uh, from a, another Susie, actually, not me. Um, why is it important that women form a new relationship with the past? Mm, great question. This is the whole crux of the book. That's exactly what I'm asking. It's not, I mean, there's multiple things I'm trying to do in this book. I'm trying to get us to see the medieval period differently um, by broadening the frame out 
onto 50% of the population that have been largely written out of the narrative. I hope to find even more people that have been written out of the narrative. Um, so that's part of what I'm trying to do, open the frame up. But I think this is, this is such an important question because I have changed in the writing of Femina. By the end of the book, I felt differently about my role as a woman. I felt empowered. I felt that even me, you know, a woman who gets has the benefit of, of being, you know, having an amazing education of being able to get any, you know, the job that I want and to fulfill my dreams. I still lean into stereotypes of, of needing to be the perfect mother, the perfect wife, the perfect domestic goddess and do all those other things. Why? Why do I feel the need to do those things? Because We've been conditioned over the last few centuries to feel that way. But when I was finding these mavericks, these breakaway women who just sort of went, no, I, I, you know, I can, I can be brilliant on my own terms. I kind of got to the end of writing this book and I thought, yeah, I feel differently. I feel better about myself knowing they existed. And I think we could use it as a way to challenge so many of the narratives that have been given to us that are about, that have informed our identities, that have influenced how we feel about ourselves and about others in society. So I do think it's important and I do think it's actually a really empowering thing. So thank you for that question, Susie. It's a great one. Well, I think also, just to say that I think you writing a feminine, but I think also reading it, I think there's, you know, you're, you're traveling the world at the moment and it, there's a mass response. It was an instant bestseller. I think there's an uprising happening here. We, we resonate with what you found and we go yeah it's time it's time um, i think that's so kind of you to say i mean i do think that um I, I can't believe i've had to write this book almost in 2023 i'm almost surprised and shamed that i have to write this book because these are things we should know and yet the narrative is still it's, we're still venerating great men we're still you know subjecting ourselves to the same patterns and and we need to really probe at those and say you know have we actually been fed a fed a yarn have we been told stories in a way that have influenced us and what happens if we go back to the evidence what go, go, happens if we go back to the real people at the heart of these stories well we get a different story yeah and, and you're mentioning story i mean the whole uh, reason we started the Annex Story Fest is the power of stories to change the narrative. And, you know, yeah. sometimes we're very powerless and they, they kind of, we don't have agency. So to change, to, and this feels like reclaiming a story, which is just yeah. incredibly yeah. exciting, really exciting. Thank I've got another, I know, hooray. Uh, we've got uh, Hexam TV, we've got um, a question who are hosting us. What do we need to do differently to create societies to enable women to flourish? Well, this is, again, a fabulous question. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think it is absolutely about challenging our narratives. It is about scrutinising what we're being told, how we're being told it, and who is telling us it, and why. You know, <laughs> there is so much at the heart of, of um, understanding history that is about manipulating narratives. So I'm working on my second, my next book at the moment, which is going to be looking at ideas of national identity, where we get our ideas of nationalism. Nationalism is a, a huge topic at the moment. It's, it's impacting the world in profound and possibly dangerous ways. And yet so many national histories are written on um, on the basis of information that's given to them by historians and then totally manipulated and misused. There's a, a wonderful quote by, um, by a, a, a historian that works specifically on nationalism who says that the historians are the opiate suppliers for nationalists. We give them the raw materials and they abuse it. So I think we need to be looking at our narratives, really going back to facts, back to the origin stories, back to the you know real people at the heart of these things, and maybe then we can we can find truth and, and carry it through with us. Yeah, so to discover our origins, or to reclaim our origin story. It's the top of the hour, Janina. I just want to take. We've got a lovely audience here, Annika. I just want to take one question from the audience, and then we'll make it our last question because I really appreciate your time. Do we have? I can stay with you all day. I love it. <laughs> Would anybody like to ask a question? Now we've got Janina. One question from our Anik audience. <laughs> oh, well. oh, everyone's being shy. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask one more question. Is um, how can we help to unsilence women? Um, I think that it has to come from all directions. It has to come from the top down. 
I think that, um, you know, the more that that there can be an understanding in the upper echelons, in the powerhouses of, of politics and trade and industry and culture, that it is important to have women at every every level of society, but it also has to come from a groundswell. It has to come from the bottom up. We've had some incredibly important things happen over the last few years. Not only have we lived through a pandemic, we have also had Me Too, Black Lives Matter. We've been um, you know, understanding issues of LGBTQ sexuality so much more than we ever had. And this groundswell is, I think, what will push up not just women's voices, but all these excluded voices, all these these voices that have been suppressed and kept down. So it has to come from the top, has to come from the bottom, and we've all got to work together to, to face it. But I think the work that you're doing, I can't thank you enough for writing Feminine and for Goddess because you're bringing it to a level of awareness that we can start to discuss it. And because you're an expert in history, that you can bring this to it. For me, I've, just, I've learned so much tonight. And I love this idea of <laughs> looking at the symbolism uh, and yeah, how that's yeah. woven in and how, you know, as you say, women had such a massive role of, let's say, bringing a different kind of spirituality to the UK. Wow, that is incredible. Um, it is, and I think it's 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 hard to find women in the past because the first place that they will be written out is in the text. And that's where I got the title from, Femino. It's about the, the way that women's texts were burnt, destroyed, removed, ignored, overlooked. If you're looking for them in books, it, you're going to struggle. But if you are looking at them in the landscape, in the artifacts, in the archaeology, in their own bones, you know, if you're trying to find them through their DNA, they are suddenly there. They were hidden in plain sight all along. And that's why it's so exciting. It's the start of a really exciting period in, in, in engaging with the past. Yeah, engaging with the past, and that's what you do so well. And thank you for doing it for us on our behalf. Janina Ramirez, I, I, I'm so excited that you managed to get here and we managed to get the tech working and all of that thing. Yeah. Thank you for joining us for Annex Story Fest. I think you're, what the work that you're doing around stories and narrative is one of the most important things that we can all focus on. I can't recommend your book enough. Everybody go and read <laughs> Uh, Femina and also your beautiful goddess book as well. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. I have a glass of wine now. <laughs> <laughs> Bye everyone.